One more time. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Ben Eifert. He's a Stanford undergrad, Cal PhD. We're going to talk about his firm, Quantitative Volatility Research, right after this. Tobias Carlisle is the founder and principal of Acquires Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquires Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hi, Ben. How are you? I'm well, Toby. Great to talk to you. It's been a while. Likewise, uh, we were introduced by Chris Cole uh, a number of years ago, and I think that uh, that's likely because uh, you're a volatility guy, just like Chris, but you have a slightly different approach to Chris. So where Chris is crisis alpha, uh, you, you, you're, not so, you're not offering one single thing. You're prepared to you'll, you'll hedge for some clients, you'll offer alpha for others. Is that, is that a fair description of QVR? Yeah, I think, you know, the way that the world has evolved um, now versus, say, 10 or 15 years ago, the institutional allocator community is a lot more sophisticated, uh, has uh, a lot more involvement in a wider variety of, of types of strategies and types of instruments and types of securities. And I think the types of folks that we talk to, you know, they know what's in their portfolios. They know what risk factors they think they're exposed to. They they have some idea. What they're really looking for isn't just uh, someone to manage some more of their money. It's, you know, what can I put in my portfolio that makes it a better portfolio from an overall risk reward perspective, right? And depending on the allocator, that might be any number of different things. Uh, and I think our idea is really how can we bring our skill set and our infrastructure in the options and volatility markets to bear uh, to solve the types of problems that institutional allocators have. And so, you know, I think one major area that we've always been involved in is different types of relative value or, or absolute return um, trading in that in that space. But uh, there we also speak with a lot of folks about more tail risk hedging types of needs. Uh, and with other folks about uh, more alternative beta, if you want to use that loaded term, or you know, yield generation um, types of needs for for folks that need to invest and uh, and make some money. So there's a, a, I think a wide variety of of types of things that uh, that we do. So you could be approached with a question as open ended as what can you do for us, or do they come to you and say we have this very specific need to hedge this problem? How would we do it with volatility? Yeah, it can it can be anywhere along that spectrum. I and mean, often often the way, you know, the a conversation might go is you'll get introduced to a pension fund manager, for example, that, you know, is looking at the world and thinking, gosh, you know what, we're we're long a whole lot of, of equities and we have to be and that's, you know, what makes sense, but I'm pretty worried about the medium term outlook for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, you know, what uh, gosh, I remember back in 2008 when my firm had to, you know, fire sell equities with S&P 650 because we didn't have the cash to pay benefits. Um, so what can I do in the current market environment that doesn't cost me too much that will give me some protection against that type of, of environment? You know, here's what my portfolio looks like. It has this kind of global, you know, asset allocation characteristics. So that might be a net, you know, one type of way that a conversation might evolve. And when you're expressing those trades for them you're doing it purely through options or are you doing that options and futures how does the trade get expressed in practical terms yeah so depends on uh, on what type of exposure but often it'll be options um we might uh, for for relatively simple tail risk hedging type of trades which we were going along that example um you might not need futures usually futures would be something more involved in in dynamic hedging of an option position like if you want but uh for for a simple static tail risk allocation you might not need that um so there might be some some listed equity options uh there might be depending on again the set of needs there might be listed options in other asset classes like you know treasury bond futures for for example or treasury bond options 
there might in some cases be some over-the-counter derivatives uh, that meet other different kinds of needs, things called variance swaps, for example, that are just a pure play um, exposure to, to volatility and tail risk. And you, you find that there's sufficient liquidity to, in the options, in listed options, to even in single names, to, to, to put those trades on? So liquidity in, I would, I would make a couple of, of distinctions of what we mean. So in, on primarily what we do, uh, we're more index focused than we are single name focused. I think typically the types of risks that a, a large institution is worried about from a tail risk perspective in particular, you know, are usually broad macro events. They're not usually specifically trying to hedge individual equity exposures that they have, or if they do, that's, a, you know, again, a, just a very specific thing. Uh, so we tend to live more in index region sector type of exposures. Uh, liquidity in general in the option markets, I think in, in index have, has, in our view, certainly volumes have increased and increased and increased very steadily every year for the last, you know, many years in, in index, whereas that wouldn't be the case really in single name options. I think single name option volumes have, have somewhat stagnated or at least grown not nearly as quickly as, as index. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Well, um, what, what are those reasons? So what, one reason I think is just that when you are a, you have to think of, Ultimately, uh, the primary um, you know, market makers in, in options are going to be the, the bank, the broker dealers, and also the major electronic option market makers like Citadel and like uh, you know Walleye and a, a various other folks. Those folks are trying to you know solve a pretty specific um, risk management problem when they're doing business, right? Which is they want to do lots of volume with some some edge, and that they're you know making bids and offers and and people are, are paying them some spread that covers some of the risk that they get into a position that moves against them. In, in single names, the, you know, the toxicity risk of, of flow is higher, right? Because people lift you on those nickel calls on you know, some funny company right before earnings. Um, and just the asymmetry of information is, is m a much worse problem for a dealer. Um, in the, I would say, 10 or 15 years ago, banks and other organizations involved in market making were just making money hand over fist in everything that they were doing. And when things are going that well, you can be aggressive across a variety of business lines that maybe aren't as profitable for you and just as part of an overall business, right? So I think that's why, um, you know, banks were, were more aggressive, say, even in 2008 or, you know, 2007 on some single name related things, you know, whereas index, you don't have nearly the same asymmetric information problem, right? S and P options, you know, for the most part, there really aren't events and special situations of a, of a very, very major variety. Obviously, there's Fed releases, and there's there's certain kinds of discrete moments when information becomes available that someone might have gotten a hold of. But it's just a much smaller uh, adverse selection problem for market makers. So I think that's what's really bifurcated the the liquidity there. I think since the two thousand and seven nine crash uh a lot of folks have been very nervous about the market for some reason that seems to be uh that seems to have lingered a lot longer than the the uh, the dot-com crash and so it's been it, it's my impression that it's been in, it's been expensive to hedge for much of the last decade uh how when how, how can you hedge more cheaply or how do they how, how can you express a uh how can you put that crisis off a tail hedge on uh, and do it in a more cost effective way? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, a couple of things. Um, generally, options and volatility and tail risk uh, became extremely expensive in the immediate wake of, of the crisis, as you point out. Right? I, unfortunately, the behavioral reality of these things is that the most demand for for hedging happens after the event that you you know you should have hedged right, um, and we can you know you, you know all the all the reasons why that why that is uh, better than I do. The um, so from 2009, 10, 11, 12, there was a persistent very high risk premium um, in general across the options landscape, especially in index, which again was the go to hedge if you're nervous you go buy S and P options. Um, that. And, you know, and that was driven by again broad-based demand for hedging. Lots of big institutional investors put you know systematic tail risk hedging programs in place where they just said we're willing to burn 
you know, 1% a year or 2% a year as a hedge budget uh, to go try to protect the downside. The cumulative effect, of course, of everybody going and buying protection and nobody, everybody being scared to sell it is that it becomes way too expensive, right? So a lot of those programs lost money very quickly for several years. And, you know, obviously their value were, didn't turn out to be good values for the, for the folks that were running them. And you started to see mo a lot of those large scale institutional hedging programs start to die off say 2013, 2014, 2015. Um, many of those same institutions then over time um, replaced those programs, not explicitly, but with, uh, with option selling programs for yield generation, typically different types of options, more towards the front of the, the you know, short term options and things. Um, but in general, there's been much, much less demand uh, for, for protection of portfolios over the last call it five years uh, than there was um, in the five years after the crisis. So there's to some extent this, this significant crisis hangover, as you uh, as you point out. I think that in option markets anyway, that's, I, I would argue, mostly gone away. Um, generally speaking, you always expect there to be some risk premium in option markets, the same way there are in any markets, right? And, Unless unless things are incredibly distorted, you should have a positive expected return on equities, and on credit, you should have a negative, you know, expected return on buying volatility and, and hedges. Uh, and that's still certainly true, but we think much much less uh, in, than it was for a time. Now uh, that said, you know, to more specifically, just to your point, where do you find? Um, relatively affordable uh, tail risk protection because, of course, all all things all prices aren't aren't created equal. Um, the first question you have to ask yourself is, well, if it's if it's going to be relatively inexpensive, you have to find somebody who's selling it to you, right? Um, because if you're having to pay some, you know, if you're having to go out and pay someone to manufacture it at you know a high at a high cost themselves, it's going to be different. And so one major source of supply of tail protection. Uh, that's available in the in the the post uh, 2008 environment, and particularly the last five years. Um, so, if you think of retail structured product investors, um, it's a concept that for U.S. investors isn't as you know top of top of mind because I think typical U.S. investors and retail investors they buy stocks and they buy bonds and now they buy ETFs and, and mutual funds and so forth. But globally, especially in Europe and Asia. Um, Retail investors predominantly um, do other types of things. They go to their local branch of BNP Paribas and they buy a structured note that might be a four-year note um, that gives them an eight or a ten percent coupon uh, in exchange for uh, in the in the current environment, typically in exchange for taking some equity market downside risk. Um, so actually, back up a second. In the in the old days, the more more typical thing that people that European folks used to buy were, were principal protected notes. So think of in a world where interest rates are five or six percent, um, you as a bank can offer to a customer uh, a principal protected investment in equities, say in just an index, for example, um, by taking their their hundred dollars, locking it up for four or five years, buying them some some long term call options and then buying them some zero coupon bonds enough to give them their money back if stocks go down, right? And that's called a principal protected note. Those type of investments were very popular for, for a long time. That works when interest rates are sufficient to buy a zero coupon bond and make that all work out, right? Um, what replaced that in the, in the wake of 2008, slowly as interest rates went down and stayed down and long-term interest rates went down, so you couldn't really generate that kind of yield anymore, was put selling types of structures, right? So in, you can't get yield by buying it, you know, by taking interest rate exposure, you have to get yield by selling puts. And so the typical structures involved in that marketplace now might be the investor, again, puts up $100, um, they get a 10% coupon yield every year, unless at some point the equity market that's referenced in the note is down 30 or 30, you know, 30% 30 upon which the investor just gets put into those equities at that price. Right. So they take, you know, some bad left tail equity risk in exchange for getting a, a coupon on the upside. In, in doing that, the retail investor who's buying that note is selling effectively selling long term, deep out of the money tail protection and the bank is buying it. And then the bank isn't in the business of just holding on to that. The bank then recycles that into the markets through uh, through typically selling down long term downside puts as a hedge. 
And so those are very big businesses globally, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of issuance of those types of products a year um, that effectively involve retail investors selling you tail risk insurance on the S&P, on the on the euro stocks, on the Nikkei, on uh, the HSCEI. So the major big global indices uh, are all very popular and there's all kinds of structures and products. Right. But that's that kind of gives you an answer to the question, well, gosh, who's going to sell me um, some some nice tail protection? So basically, the investors in Japan, Japanese investors first, I guess, and then um, more recently, European investors are starved for yield. And the way that they are provided with that yield, you sell some puts uh, out far enough that you hope that they're not struck. And then you, you get this yield in the in the interim. Are the, are the Japanese notes, are they called Eurodashi notes? Is that the... Yeah, so, so Eurodashi notes are the typical um, name in, uh, in Japan. Uh, in uh, These pop products are also very popular in Korea. There's a huge, uh, huge market in Korea that's linked to all manner of other global indices. Um, and then European investors as well. But yeah, the, I think the Japanese structured note market in the Eurodashis is one of the oldest and, and best developed. Because similarly, to your point, Japanese rates have been low, low for a long time, actually. Right. So they had Jap Japan had its its major bubble and then bust in the early 90s uh, and it has really been in sort of a stag, you know, stagnation deflation environment ever since. And so that's provided the impetus for the development of these markets. I, I have two thoughts about that. One is that do you, do you think that the Japanese buyers of these notes understand the risk that the note carries with it? Uh, I think tip, typically they understand the basic notion that if you know the markets are very bad, they're going to lose some money. Um, these notes are often quite complex, actually, um, and I think the, the the complexities of the notes are are often probably lost. I mean, in many cases, for example, the notes will be linked not just to one index, but like to the worst performing of a basket of three indices, and they might also have some features about how the notes. Um, get called back to the issuer if the market's up a certain amount. And, you know, they turn into actually very complicated derivative products that you need, you know, fancy quants to think about how to price and so forth. Um, really, you know, I think generally my view would be that retail investors probably would be better served um, trying to do simpler things that they that they understood stood a bit better. But the basic uh, the basic allure is uh, that it's hard to find anything that's going to give you an optical eight or 10 percent yield you know, anywhere in the world, right? And I think people compare um, the, that type of product to the type of, of really gnarly credit you'd have to buy these days to get an eight or 10% yield. And they say, right. God, this seems better, right? It's the, you know, it's a, it's, it's large cap equity risk. It's not, um, you know, some, some near bankrupt company. I, I don't mind it behaviorally, though, if you're forced to buy down 30%, it's probably not a pl bad place to be, to be buying equities. So that's that's uh, that's the tail hedging, and that's the source of the. That's where you can at least find some liquidity, and you can find some better pricing. On the alpha side, what sort of strategies do you implement to try and generate returns? So it's everything. I think starts from from the same basic thought process, which is, you know, derivatives markets exist uh, not because. There are guys like us who, you know, want to go find some, you know, some sneaky trades to do to try to generate some alpha. Der derivatives markets exist because uh, because there are end users of derivatives that are trying to achieve some objective, right? And most of those, uh, so so for example, you know, those retail investors selling those uh, buying structured products and effectively selling puts are are an example of that. They are an end user of derivatives, um, pension funds. Uh, pension funds who are buying, you know, downside protection to hedge are an end user of derivatives. Uh, and, and these days, pension funds who are uh, selling short term options, for example, in the context of call overwriting, uh, overwriting calls over their existing equity portfolio are, are end users of derivatives. So our uh, an, an absolute return investment process in derivatives would typically just start with asking the question, you know, where are there big imbalances in the market, either temporary or relatively persistent where some end user is doing some or some end user or some large group of end users are doing something in very big size you know because it achieves one of their objectives um, but that's uh, you know too large relative to the market or that's congesting a particular part of the market um, and so uh, an, an example in the last several years is uh, I started to allude to 
uh, call overwriting and cash secured put selling typically relatively short dated uh, in uh, in index options has become very, very popular among large institutional investors. Um, these types of strategies. So, for example, you take a, you know, $100 billion pension fund um, that has $60 billion of equity exposure. Um, that investor is going to say, look, if, if stocks are up 30% this year, I'm going to be doing great. Um, what can I do that path diversifies me a bit so that if stocks are flat, um, I do a little bit better? Well, one thing I could do is I could, I own 60 billion of equities, maybe I sell $10 billion of call options against those equities, right? So then that investor will do slightly less well if the market goes up 30%, but look, he's gonna be fine. Um, if the market's flat, he's probably going to harvest some yield from from selling those options. Um, so, if so the market's just down, just so I can just, just so I can uh, simplify, so you, they're they're basically selling some strike above thirty mm -hmm. on the call, so that they, they're on the on the on the basis that thirty percent is a great year for anybody. Anything above that's just being greedy. We're much more likely to have returns below that, so we can get some yield by selling those those strikes that are out. Out further is that is that the is that the approach? Yeah, that's the basic idea, and it typically wouldn't be you know one year thirty percent you know upside strikes. Typically, it would be every month they might sell you know ten billion dollars of you know th two or three percent out of the money strikes, but then do that every month you know roll that type of position every month. So you know some months are going to be flat months, and they'll and they'll just collect the premium that they sold. You know, some months are going to be up five percent, and then they'll lose a bit of money on the on that particular month on the the options that they sold. Some months will be down months in the equity market, and they'll and they'll make a little money. And their and their bet is that over the course of a year, uh, selling those modestly out of the money strikes every every month, um, they're going to to harvest some. They're going to net collect some premium, or at least you know, if the market is up huge, they will have given back some money on that program, but their underlying equity exposure is very large, much larger typically than their than they're overriding. So so it's a way to you know transfer some returns from a scenario path where the market's up a lot to a scenario path where the market's flat and choppy or maybe even down small or, or something like that. Um, so these types of, of programs are very popular. And also if you're to look at a you know a 30 year back test of the performance of these types of strategies, they look very, very good. Um, largely because short-term options for a long time were really quite expensive. Um, I think our view is that what you've then seen happen is these pop strategies to grow in popularity to such an extent, um, you know, now a pretty significant portion of the large-scale institutional investor community has some type of call overwriting program, for example. It might be 40% of pensions. For, um, and the size of those um, and and most folks are doing something very uh, very similar so typically they'll sell you know relatively near the money slightly upside one month options so everybody's doing the same thing in very big size and what that typically does is it changes you know the price and changes the forward looking expected performance relative to that 30 year back test that you know that you did in the first place and so uh, and so what folks like us, uh, when we're looking at absolute return strategies, we think, okay, uh, most likely you're, we are supposed to actually be buyers of that oversold um, part of the options market. And we're probably supposed to think about what else we can sell against it to hedge so that we have a hedged position where we're buying something cheap and, and selling something expensive. And then you have to go do a bunch of work and figure out, well, how would you actually do that and what would make the most sense and what type of a portfolio are you going to have um, and uh, and so forth. But that the starting point is almost always, you know, where is there some kind of dynamic in the market that's involving, um, you know, some large scale um, behavior by end users of derivatives that's uh, that's making something too cheap or, or something too expensive and then how do you structure a strategy around that how are you making the assessment that it's too cheap or too expensive so with options typically what you're looking at right is when you when you trade relatively short-term options um, those options you can normalize their price in some sense into what we call an implied volatility, right? Because as we typically 
and volatility traders and market makers don't retain directional exposure to options, we would always, so if we were to buy a, a, a call option, we would sell um, sell equity against it to be neutral to the, to the equity market. Um, if you were to compare that implied volatility or normalized price, the, 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 the level of volatility that would justify the current dollar market price of options to um, expectations of the actual realized volatility that you're going to see in the market, um, that tells you something about how uh, cheap or expensive those options are. If you were to look um, 10, 20, 30 years ago, typical levels of implied volatility for short-term options were much higher relative to the likely level of realized volatility that was going to occur. Uh, so that premium was much higher. Uh, than it is in the last in the last several years, and, and, and that's that's why the end users have put those trades on because they're trying to harvest that. And now that that's been suppressed, it creates an opportunity for you. So you're trying not to be directional to the equity. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to be? Are you trying to be neutral to the volatility, or are you are you somewhat directional to the volatility? We always have some type of volatility exposure, but we're not in this case. We're not only in an absolute return. Uh, mandate anyway. We're not only buying those options and then and then, you know, hoping for for volatility to emerge. What we're doing is looking elsewhere for, uh, for example, slightly longer term options where there's more of a balance between buying and selling and supply and demand, um, and where the you know the profitability is driven also by things like what is the what is the term structure of implied volatility look like is it much higher for somewhat longer term options and and how do you uh, and how does that work and, and being able to structure a portfolio with sh both shorter term and longer term options does that uh, does, do those do those occur because there's some event um is that there's some political event? so i, I sometimes there's volatility around presidential elections or there's volatility around macroeconomic events globally is that is that what creates the, the, the unusual shapes in the, the term structure? Uh, so there is event pricing in the, in the term structure. So you'll always notice, um, you know, the options expiring immediately after some well-defined known catalyst, like a Fed meeting, for example, will be, you know, will trade at some premium. Um, but in, in general, the shape of the, you know, the level of implied volatility for options at different, um, with different amount of time to maturity, and a different strike price, so downside puts versus upside calls, really is all determined by supply and demand. So who's buying what and who's selling what. Right? So typically when markets are relatively quiet and volatility is low, uh, usually the term structure of implied volatility, which just means what is the level of implied volatility for you know one month options, two month options, three month options, what is the shape of that relationship? Typically it's upward sloping. Because the notion is, look, I mean, if things are quiet right now, in in a year or two, who knows? All, all kinds of things can happen. And if you want to take, if you're going to sell a one-year option to someone, you're obviously taking some risk that things change and the world gets, you know, more volatile. And so, typically, in a quiet environment, that would trade at a at a, at a premium uh, to a to a short-term option. But supply and demand really, really uh, is what determines all those uh, all of those parameters. So just to just to step back slightly, um, you 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 have an undergrad in economics and then your PhD from Cal. Uh, what was your PhD in? Uh, it was also in economics, actually. And then you went and worked in in emerging mar in an emerging markets economist for the World Bank. That's right. Yeah. So I worked for the chief economist of the World Bank. Um, initially, mostly focused on uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and then. Uh, uh, some work on Latin America and India across a, a variety of different things. But yeah, so emerging markets macro. So how do you then transition from, I, I don't imagine there's an enormous amount of math in something like that into something that's heavily math driven. Uh, that, that's, a, that's an unusual step. Yeah, and actually, I realize I just got, uh, I think we did the timing slightly wrong. So I worked for the World Bank in between undergraduate and grad school. And so, uh, and so in, uh, in grad school, um, I did some emerging markets macro work, and actually my thesis was in that area, but uh, over time started working more and more on, uh, on finance. And, you know, gra graduate school in a technical discipline is like anything else. Um, you know, you can do 
a wide variety of different types of things and acquire a wide variety of different types of skills. And, um, you know, in, uh, in my case, you know, applied statistics and applied math is sort of the core, you know, the core of it. And, uh, and finance is, um, in the or quantitative finance is, is sort of a, f- a field of that. So you learn how to write code and you learn how to program computers and you learn how to, how to do statistics and, and so forth. And, and, uh, you get a job and you learn what you got to do. <laughs> so yeah, from there I went to the, um, uh, I worked actually at a at a hedge fund for a while while I was in grad school. But my first real job uh, was on the Wells Fargo prop desk after uh, after grad school. And and what were you doing on the desk? So I was a quant. Uh, I was um, the main quant, and then I hired a few people and ran a, ran a small quant team um, on the, uh, at Wells Fargo, and then. We did uh, that business spun out and became uh, a hedge fund. Um, eventually, I started picking up some responsibility for the um, for derivatives trades that were outside the core wheelhouse of the business. Uh, so the, that business was primarily focused on corporate securities, so things like convertible bond arbitrage, uh, capital structure arbitrage, um, trading, you know, secured debt versus unsecured debt. Um, I started doing some of the, for example, um, currency derivatives, um, so more macro-oriented um, uh, volatility uh, trading, primarily from a from a portfolio hedging perspective uh, initially, and then uh, and then we did build out more of a pure play derivatives relative value volatility trading um, piece of that uh, of that business subsequently. And you, you were a lecturer at Haas, at Berkeley Haas at some stage. They have a, they have a quant finance school. Is that, is that what you're doing? There? Yeah, so they have a master's in financial engineering program, which is a great program. Um, I taught in that program you know, as part of uh, graduate school for right. several years. And then uh, subsequently, uh, at least uh, for a few years, um, I'm not re- it's It's a big, t- it's too bad. It's a very tough time, you know, competition for time. Uh, teaching is one is great and I really enjoy it. And it is actually useful from a business perspective because, you know, there's not really a better way to recruit than to have continued direct exposure to students as opposed to, you know, you interview somebody a few times and um, you're primarily often testing whether they're good at interviewing. Um, but, uh, it's, but it's a big time, uh, it is a big time demand. So I don't cur- I'm not currently teaching. And then you launched QVR in 2016. I was, would have been uh, 2016. I was, I was working on it. So I was on garden leave, um, all of 2016 and building a lot of the core infrastructure, but then we, we did launch the business in 2017. And your clients tend to be large institutions for the most part who approach you with a specific problem and it could be hedging or it could be, be alpha generation. Can we talk a little bit more about um, the, I, I heard your conversation with Corey, you were discussing some interesting, uh, one, one interesting trade anyway, that was uh, tra- trading volatility of energy companies in large cap versus small cap. Can you just talk, w- walk us through that? Sure. So I think, you know, this is a, an absolute return uh, trade example, uh, the type of thing that would come up in the context of some of our strategy sleeves in, in relative value trading. So I think the example that I gave was, you know, there are obviously many participants in uh, ETF option markets. Um, uh, one major use case, I think I gave the example again of, of overwriting, right? So I think I gave the example of what happens when uh, there's a large fund manager who, for example, owns uh, a lot of equities in uh, in small cap energy and decides to to do some large scale overwriting, sell a whole bunch of call options. Typically, what we would see is we would see the prices of options on those small cap uh, energy uh, names, or I think I'd maybe give the example of the ETF, maybe XOP, you know, um, an ENP ETF. You'd see those prices fall uh, significantly relative to um, where they were previously and a relative also to the prices of, of options on large cap energy names or uh, XLE, for example. And you'd probably uh, also see that nothing really appeared to change in the dynamics of, of realized volatility in those in those sectors. It wasn't that suddenly um, 
you know, the XLE names, the large cap names became a lot more volatile relative to the small cap names. And, you know, we might see direct evidence that those trades happen. Probably you would see those if, if they were done and listed, you'd probably actually see the transactions occur and you, you know, hear that they occurred. And um, typically, you know, we have a, a variety of models for thinking about this. But but one thing we might end up doing is buying those options on the small cap uh, energy names that were heavily sold by the overwriter down to a, a significantly cheaper price. And we might hedge by selling uh, the options on the, on the large cap names um, and then be in a relative value trade position. That again is the result of a more temporary point in time demand by end users, in this case, uh, an owner of, of the equities who was willing to sell off the upside above, above some point and did it in such large size that he depressed the, the relative price. So it's somewhat opportunistic when you're finding these, uh, these trades. How do, you, how do you screen for them or how do you hunt for them? I mean, that, that type of thing where it would be something where you know, you're continue, as, a, as a business in this space, right, you're, you, you obviously have um, the full data history on all of these types of things, where are, all of, where are the options on all the different major liquid sectors um, trading, and, you, and uh, you, know, you have models that very quickly observe the price changes and you know, all the other signals associated with that and would be highlighting that to you, right? So it's opportunistic in a sense, but really um, you, could, you could manage that type of a strategy um, you know, compl nearly completely systematically um, if, if you, if you, you know, so chose in that you're monitoring uh, many, many, many different relationships like that continually and, and have signals that are triggering when uh, significant changes in price happen that don't have any clear uh, justification in underlying price dynamics. So that's, that's my next question here. Is it enough that the trade seems to you to be mispriced or do you then need to find out, do you need to understand why? So we like to understand why. Um, at, a, at a minimum, we like to uh, validate to ourselves that there is not a really good reason why this price is changing. Right? So in derivatives markets, you know, typically large price changes either happen because something underlying structural is changing and the price change is justified or because there's some large transactions that just there's a big buyer or a big seller and they're changing the price. And we, we would like to be involved in the latter and not in the former. Right? Um, uh, you know, obviously one example, it, in, in that particular example, the thing that you would be worried about if would be, you know, if there was some, I mean, in that example, it's hard to think of, but you know, some fundamental reason why the large, why the small cap energy names were going to be really quiet for the next month or, or something, whether there would be something regulatory. Um, I don't have a great immediate example off the top of my head, but like a similar thing, that's a, I think a better example. Um, in and it's a, gets a bit, a bit wonky, but if you think back to Japan in the in 2012, 2013, remember the Japanese equity market had been, you know, dead for a long time, um, at very depressed levels and very quiet. Um, and one market price change that people started to notice was that um, the the price of call options upside call options and the Nikkei was starting to go up a lot relative to the price of downside put options. So in some sense, you know, people who were buying options were doing so in a very bullish way, um, you know, for, for, for the market, if you want to think of it that way. And, you know, this was the type of, it was the type of thing where if you were just running some historical data analysis through some, through some statistical models and, uh, coming up with a judgment thereof, you would have said, gosh, this is a really big price change that we don't really, to an extent that you don't really ever see it before, and this is silly, and you're supposed to do some kind of trade that involves, you know, betting on, on mean reversion, or selling those call options and buying the put options and doing some kind of hedge. But the key thing to, to understand that, you know, it was, you know, Abe was putting in place uh, a bunch of new large scale programs involving huge some new central bank easing and structural reform. And the marketplace was getting really focused on the possibility that the Japanese economy would be revitalized and the equity market would go on a big tear. And that is, you know, really what you saw was, you know, a, a violent, highly volatile rally in the Japanese equity market. Um, and if you had 
if you had just naively looked at market prices going up in these calls and down in these puts and said that this is silly, it's some kind of statistical aberration, you're supposed to trade against that, um, you know, which some folks did, you, you really got run over, right? So you have, so I think from our perspective, um, you know, we're, we're always most interested in, again, price dislocations coming from end users and flow, we want to be able to validate um, from a defensive perspective that there's no, you know, big macro regime change that's driving uh, what appears to be a change in prices. If there is, we probably just don't want to be don't want to be involved. We might you know, might have a view on Abenomics or not. But um, we know that there's smart macro people, smart macro traders who are making those bets. And um, our job is not to bet against them. And there was a similar uh, this similar event with Volmageddon in February 2018. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in in February 2018, I mean, the, the, the lead up to that, of course, was that retail investors largely um, first discovered VIX products and volatility markets, call it back in, in 2011, 2012. Um, and I think, again, those markets are somewhat complex. Uh, retail investors really liked buying volatility through those products because it was very easy to do. Uh, it became extremely overpriced in that product, and and folks didn't really understand why they were losing money because the you know why, if I bought the VIX if I bought a VIX and VIX was 15 and VIX is still 15 why am I losing money? They didn't necessarily understand that they were buying futures and futures have a term structure and so forth. So after several years of losing money doing this, the retail investment crowd um, discovered that they could just short the same the same, <laughs> the same products instead of buying them. Uh, and actually, new ETFs were created that 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 did that under the hood and allowed them to just buy an ETF, which was effectively shorting VIX products. And uh, those investments did very well for a period of time, um, but became too large for the market. And uh, volatility went down and down and down, and the risk premium embedded in those products went down and down and down, and that and that culminated in Balmageddon, as as you said in in February 2018. Um, one market price change that folks observed uh, uh, ahead of that was that options on VIX products, particularly upside call options, were becoming very expensive in the sense of just that you know the price was rising. So clearly, people were buying them um, again to relatively unusually high levels. Um, but the really the justification for that was that this this event, this possible event of this major short squeeze in the VIX complex uh, and the, the unwinding of some of those ETNs was looking very plausible and looking potentially like it could happen in a relatively short period of time. And so certainly selling those optically expensive um, VIX calls would not have worked out you know, very well for you. And again, so understanding the landscape, understanding the, the risk characteristics you know, that are out there in the world. Um, uh, is really important, not just seeing a you know a time series chart of of some index and thinking it's too high. Well, investors seem to have been chastened in the aftermath of XIV failing and so on. But do you see any uh, emerging um, changes to the volatility term structure, or do you see anything out there that's that's skewing the 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 market for volatility? Um, you know, certainly not. Uh, I don't th see anything equivalent to, you know, the VIX complex in late 2017, early 2018, where you really felt like there was a ticking time bomb to some extent, um, where you didn't know the timing, but you figured it was highly probable that um, there would be a bad event at some point. Um, generally speaking, you know, our view is that there's, again, very heavy selling of short term index options uh, via call overwriting and, and put underwriting by large institutions. Um, probably to the point that's significantly depressed expected returns that those folks think they're getting relative to historical benchmarks. Um, that's not a that's not a blow up risk. That's very different, right? These are large, deep pocketed institutional investors overwriting calls against some proportion of their equity portfolio, right? So they can underperform their expectations, but there's no sense in which this is some kind of blow up blow up risk. Um, the uh, the uh, the only other you know there is some risk. We talked a little bit about retail structured products and how there's some supply of tail risk coming out of that. Um, the there is some risk in that landscape, just in the sense that those structured products are typically again relatively complex. 
banks issue them and hedge them. And the hedging of complex products is usually a complicated and error prone um, and risky, you know, business. And there are scenarios uh, where the equity market is down a you know, 30 or 35 percent over three to six months. And uh, and that space um, generates some pretty big unexpected blow ups for banks. Um, but we saw that to some extent in uh, in China in 2015, where uh, if you recall, in summer of 2015, uh, Chinese equities almost doubled over the summer in a big bubble. And there were all of these videos of you know, vegetable, uh, of vegetable peddlers on the street with their laptops, you know, doing their trading. Uh, and then those prices subsequently fell about 50%. And uh, it did cause a big squeeze in in those longer term options associated with structured products. And there were some big losses uh, in the market. But again, th this stuff is, I think, relatively contained to specific pockets of the market that, you know, uh, don't have uh, none of it is is systemic risk or or anything of uh, of that variety. I think that most of it is you know some folks that could lose some money in the wrong scenarios. What about the structured notes that the Japanese and European Europeans are buying? What sort of behaviour does that create if they if they knock in down thirty five percent or wherever they kind of kick in? Yeah, exactly, and that's what I was alluding to. So the the trick is. Um, that those notes, you know, we talked about that the investors effectively selling put options. It's a bit trickier than that. They're, they're technically selling something which is called a, a knock in put option in the sense that um, really the investors only get put into the stocks if once the stocks are down, let's say 30 percent, for example. Um, and then they're just long stocks and there's no more option associated with that. And what that means is that the banks who are issuing and creating these notes um, initially, when they issue the note, they'll they'll do some kind of hedging. Typically, they'll sell like a you know a long term uh, out of the money put. Um, but if the market goes all the way down there and those notes start start to knock in, the bank still has that put that they're short that they sold. But there's no option anymore that they're long, right? Just the retail it was converted into a stock exposure, and so that's a tricky type of risk to manage for the banks. What it means is that at some point. Uh, as the as the equity markets go down and down and down, um, banks suddenly start getting short volatility. They're getting net short options because they used to own a long option, which they sold a, a vanilla put against, but then they don't have that option anymore. And so that creates some short squeeze, potential short squeeze dynamics where this is happening to all the banks at, all, at more or less the same time. And they're all having to go and buy back, you know, two year options, three year options, um, exactly at, at the wrong time when the market's down 30%. That's, that's the risk. So uh, on a, on a day to day basis, you're, you're just running your models, trying to find something that's uh, slightly mispriced, trying to understand why that is the case. And then, and then um, trying to find a way to trade that for, for clients. Is that, is that, is that what happens? Yeah, I mean, think of think of, there's there's going to be a variety of, of types of strategies, right? So in in absolute return land, you know, some things that we're doing, the the mispricings are slower moving, and the day to day work is more about maintaining the risk exposures that you want as the world moves, or you know, as as prices move around and so forth, and so we're rolling some some options from one maturity to another, or taking profits someplace and and increasing exposure some other place. Um, some things, as you mentioned, like in the example of that, the small cap versus large cap energy volatility exposure, that might be something where new new mispricings or new seeming mispricings pop up relatively quickly. And we want to try to assess them and, and see whether we're going to put on a, a trade or not. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, you know, it's a it's a an investment process that's built on different strategy sleeve building blocks, which each have their own logic and their own infrastructure around them for providing the information that you need to make decisions and make the fine tuning adjustments to the portfolio on a day to day basis. Similarly, a tail risk hedging program is, is typically more going to be usually things aren't changing dramatically on a day to day basis, right? You have some longer term oriented exposures. Um, at some point, you might start rolling some of those exposures to longer dated instruments once you've owned them for some number of months or so forth. But the, the exercise is um, on a day to day basis is typically more incremental. 
And in, do, are, you, are you allowed to trade a PA? Um, I, we, we are allowed to, I'm too busy to be too involved in, uh, uh, in a PA, but, um, but yes, in principle, subject to, you know, the standard restrictions. Is there, there is there an internal hedge fund or an internal, uh, way for you to pull your investments? Um, there's not, um, in, in principle. So there are firms that do that. I think our, our view is it's, you know, it is somewhat tricky running like an internal prop allocation together with client allocations you can do it but you have to of course worry about all the documentation of uh, and trade splits and allocations and making sure that you're not doing things that that you shouldn't be our, our view is that it's not um it's not necessarily worth it and so how do you invest your own money um well i'm a small business owner so most of my money <laughs> is uh, it's just right there in the in the business uh, you know supporting the uh, the activities of uh, of what we need and then the the part that's not uh, is very just long term you know is sort of how the way you would want your dad to manage his money very uh, very vanilla uh, very vanilla very long term oriented and try not to look too often try to rebalance it when you're supposed to oh, that's great Ben, uh, we're coming up on time. If folks want to get in contact with you, what's the what's the best way to do that? Sure, you can look at our website, QVRAdvisors.com. I think there's a contact form on there that, that works. Um, I think my email address is Ben at QVRAdvisors.com if, uh, if anyone wants to, to reach out to. And you're on Twitter. I am on Twitter. You can you can uh, follow me on Twitter. Fair warning, though, I think ninety five percent of my Twitter content is you know comments on what savagery my three and a half year old son is is up to lately, or uh, you know things of that variety. What music is on in the office? Um, but you're you're welcome to uh, to check me check it out. I think there's a good tweet today. It was about uh, whether you're allowed to, with with the broken headphones whether you could just pump it up. That's right. Well, yeah, yesterday markets have been very quiet as uh, as you know, as you know and so you know um, uh, the the office banter kick starts to kick up and the distractions start to to elevate. <laughs> Everybody's gone on vacation. That's right. Well, that's uh that's great. Uh thanks very much for spending some time with us Ben Ifit QVR. Absolutely, Toby. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. My pleasure.